Hi, everyone. Good morning and welcome to this Active Learning Academy workshop, engaging students through communication and scaling using randomization. We are joined today with three faculty, Angela Berardinelli, Dhruv Damani, and D.I. Von Briesen. All three of these faculty members are from the College of Computing and Informatics, and they are a special group within the Active Learning Academy this year um, as a, a, a group just from CCI within the Active Learning Academy working together. And so we're really excited to hear about um, what they're going to present to us today. And so I'm going to hand it over to Angela, Dhruv, and D.I. Thank you for presenting. Thank you, Jules. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this is a small group in the room today. So like, please interrupt us either in chat or um, just unmuting if you've got questions, comments, clarifications, and the like. Um, but we, after much discussion, decided to go with a theme of engaging students through communication and scaling using randomization. And I we are aiming to show strategies today that are applicable outside of computing, even though, as Jules mentioned, we're all in related disciplines. Um, the strategies that we're using today, I think, are widely applicable beyond just like programming centered courses. It's not going to be a here's how you teach students programming uh, type of presentation. So let's see if I can advance slides. Okay. Um, just a little bit of motivation behind the theme for this workshop. Um, communication is a key thing that we have in our gen ed for all of our students. And I think some people outside of tech uh, are surprised to learn that communication is actually just as important in technical fields as it is in you know non-technical fields and so in addition to standard workplace communications our students have communication expectations in the form of code reviews for anyone who's developing software those are meetings sometimes one-on-one -on -one, sometimes asynchronous sometimes in groups it can be done in lots of different ways where a person's code that they've written they are going to essentially have it reviewed by other programmers as to is it efficient does it do what it says is this necessary all of these kinds of things um various roles within the tech community will have to produce executive summaries of their work uh, which I think is common in a lot of fields, but this is going to need to boil down everything technical and everything business oriented into like the, the TLDR, the, the elevator pitch of what was happening. And so that that style of communication is very important in a lot of different uh, tech related jobs. And then a lot of teams, both development teams and other types of technical teams have what are called weekly stand up meetings, where it's essentially a team status report meeting that's done early. Sometimes there are formal presentations, kind of similar to what we do here in the Active Learning Academy, um, but sometimes it's just a, a round table. There, there are different formats. Um, but I do want to highlight uh, one quote here that you may have read while I was blabbing that communication skills are considered a gap in the tech field. It's actually a gap in most fields that uh, 46 footnote. I read that report uh, as well, and that was about just industry in general. It wasn't specific to tech, uh, although the other surveys mentioned here are specific to tech. But basically, there's there's considered a soft skills gap that uh, is not being filled currently in tech and outside of tech. But the challenge for us in CCI is that we are exploding in enrollment. Um, so there's, there's a graph here. The only two lines that are going down in recent years are for-profit institutions. So let's ignore those. And um, here you're seeing that every other it, type of institution, so each of these uh, line graphs are, or lines in the graph are for different types of institutions. They're all seeing growing enrollments in computing related disciplines. So information technology, computer science, data science, et cetera. Um, so as we're trying to get away from that standard 
I tell you and stand at the front of the classroom, here's what we're doing. So the things that we're, we're trying to, to get away from in the Active Learning Academy and get into more student-centered learning, how do we reconcile that we need to help our students on a personal and individual level be able to communicate clearly in lots of different formats to lots of different audiences, but we have so many students that that individual feedback is really difficult to be able to administer as an individual or even with a team of TAs. So what we're going to do today is the three of us, Drew, D.I. and myself, will discuss different strategies we've used to try and combat this problem. So some of it is through direct instruction, some of it is through innovative or experimental types of assessment. Um, so, so that's where we're headed throughout the course of the next 30 to 40 minutes. And I'm home. I'm gonna hand it over to Drew. Drew, you wanted to, to yeah. drive, right? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing then. And Drew will just pick up where I leave off in our slide deck. Hi, so I just want to introduce myself first. Um, I'm a part-time lecturer teaching a few undergrad courses at CCI. I was also a master's student in the computer science program at CCI. So I have experience with 11 courses in total here. Um, eight, I think, as a student and three as an instructor. So I want to talk a little about how assessment works for these courses. Um, they tended to primarily assess a student's ability to apply concepts through, for the most part, programming assignments that involve doing. Um, this might just be a bias I had while registering for courses, but this is at least my experience. Um, there was also a prevalence of multiple choice quizzes in all of them. Um, I bring this up because there was a lack of, let's say, communication between the student and the instructor during assessment. Uh, what I mean by that is, um, let's say you're evaluating a student's multiple choice questions. Generally, they're automatically graded, but um, <laughs> even looking at the quiz, you can't really tell what a student was thinking while he was making those choices or while he was finishing his assignment um, doing things a certain way um, uh, writing for example is the most common form of communication that happens during assessment um, i would have expected before taking or if you had had me guess how things would have been for these well, courses, I would expect it to involve a lot more writing. So of the 11 courses I have experience with, only three involved written exams with essay style questions, and then two other courses involved some form of writing for assignments. We had one course where there was a lot of writing about the code, let's say, um, before you actually do your assignment. And then there was one other course which had just some paper quizzes, which had at least one question um, that involved writing. But both of these were relatively minor. Uh, the reason I think this is somewhat interesting is because if there is no writing happening. Essentially, you don't really know what a student is thinking. If you have, let's say, 60 or 70 students in your class, um, let's say 10 or 15 of them always talk in the class, you don't really know what a student is thinking. Maybe they do all the assignments, they have a very good grade, um, all the while not taking away things in the exact way you want them to take away and maybe they're just maybe they're, they're learning perfectly but the point i'm trying to make is if the only thing you have is uh, multiple choice questions and programming assignments you can't really know for sure how your student is doing um, so what explains this lack of writing um, this is just me guessing um, i i can't know for sure but for 
um, two, except two out of 11 of these courses, there was always more than 60 students uh, in each course. The course would generally involve at least one assignment every week, generally more, and this one assignment per week is outside of uh, midterms, final exams, final projects, or presentations. Uh, the ratio of instructor and TA to students was generally one is to 20, um, except for three of these courses. Um, evaluating assignments that involved writing takes at least 15 to 20 minutes if you intend to provide good feedback. Um, for my first semester, I had some um, essay style quizzes. I generally found that um, I was writing more than the student in the feedback. Um, because if, if you want to give feedback, that's just how it goes. Um, this, if you take 20 minutes per student, it amounts to about six hours per week for grading for each member of the instructional team if there's a written assignment every week, which is, I think, just not feasible for almost every instructional team. Uh, you can solve this by maybe reducing the scope of the written assignment and to be able to grade faster. But what ends up happening is that you're just not able to assess as many things. So maybe you have some areas where you're confident uh, with how the assessment went, but y you generally have lower coverage. So that that way is how I'm guessing you end up with a preference for multiple choice quizzes and programming assignments. I would also like to mention that written assignments take a lot longer for a student to complete also, meaning that if you're assigning them a bunch of written assignments with essay style questions, uh, there's also less of the other work you can do. Uh, programming assignments are important, which is why we have a lot of them. So it's generally hard for you to be able to do both of them in the same week. So what do we do in such a situation? Um, I thought, why not just move from written to verbal uh, for your assignment? The reason being um, doing the assignment for the student and then evaluation for the instructor kind of happens at the same time. So you're saving time in some way and you basically end up with an interview, which um, as we feel, as we've seen from um, the, as we've seen from people trying to find the best candidate for jobs, interviews have always been uh, the best way to do it. So it's much easier for you to assess the student that way, but um, speaking and listening takes way longer than reading. You also end up on random tangents and discussions. And um, I'm guessing it would take about 30 minutes per student because I've done some limited um, verbal activities. Uh, so it's not really feasible to do that for every student. So what you can do at that point is um, bring randomization into the mix. So instead of interviewing every student, just the threat, <laughs> threat, of uh, a student being interviewed kind of um, leads them to do at least they are part of the work. So even though the assessment doesn't happen, uh, the student at least prepares for it. So you can assign students into groups, break a random student from the group. Uh, instead of asking all questions, you can also pick something random. So you can reduce the number of students you need to assess, and you can also reduce the, num the time per student. This was basically the thought process I had uh, before introducing a kind of activity in uh, this semester. So here's how my activity worked. So we had a flipped classroom. Lecture videos were shared with students at the beginning of the week, hosted on a service called Dropbox Replay. Uh, the reason I bring up the service is uh, it lets students annotate on any frame of the video, and they can just leave comments at that time. Uh, uh, when they end up leaving comments, what ends up happening is that uh, the service automatically adds a timestamp and then it also shows up in the seeker part, 
Uh, so you can always just see who was asking what question. Uh, students can point out uh, what part they really want to ask about, things like that. Um, and what we'd end up doing is for each lecture video, the first session for the week when we're meeting, uh, I'd go through all the questions and answer them. Uh, here, There's a QR code here if you want to check out the link yourself. Um, along with the lecture videos at the beginning of the week, I also shared a list of questions that uh, the interview was going to involve for that week. Here are some sample questions. Um, most of these questions are something that would be very hard to assess, or at least I'm just not creative enough to come up with multiple choice questions that can assess these questions. For example, why do genetics exist, or why does a concept exist? It's just hard for you to even give this as a question in a written assignment, because you'll, you'd always end up with arguments at the end. So let's say if the student gives you something that was not something you're looking for, you don't give them a good grade, uh, the student would then argue about it later, which, and because not all questions involve facts it's also hard for you to defend your assessment but if you're doing it as a verbal uh, interview style thing what you can do is uh, say that you while you're not wrong this is more of what i was looking for or just have a discussion where you point them towards the answer you're looking for so for the first session of the week they're given time to discuss the questions that were shared uh, but among themselves, the assumption is they've watched the lecture before coming to class. Um, they are expected to ask each other questions, teach each other the answers, make sure everyone in your group knows the correct answer. The reason you want to do this is because a random person from your group is going to be selected, and what grade he gets is also the grade the entire group gets. Um, in the next session, there's Google Forms sent out. I forgot to show you the proper form, but at least there's a screenshot. Um, the questions it asks is, um, it asks which student actually participated in that week's activity. For example, if you have a student that doesn't show up at all, you wouldn't want that person to represent your group in the interview. So there's a place for you to mark who actually participated in the activity. And then there's another place for you to mark who's actually present today. And then based on their answers, a, a, a random attending and participating student ends up being picked. Um, however he does in the interview is the grade for the entire group. Uh, students that are not attending and not participating are later reached out to by the TAs and penalized as per their specific situation. The grades are low stake. Uh, we have this activity for every week, and towards the end, they're good for the entire class. For example, let's say my lecture just wasn't good, and it wasn't able to explain the answers to those questions properly. Um, at that point, uh, there's some curving involved to make sure my inability doesn't affect the student's grades. And then when you find out that, okay, this is something that's happening, maybe you can fix it for the next week. Um, so what I feel the benefits are for the, this kind of activity is that it prevents one student from doing all the work. If this was a written group assignment, um, there'd just be one student doing the entire thing and submitting. Um, you can have a discussion with the aim of finding out how comfortable the student is with that week's concepts and even even if the student even if you don't know what the student actually says even from their body language and how they compose their sentences you can tell how he's learning he or she so forcing engagement um, this activity also forces students to actually talk to each other uh, there's no way you can know if the other people in your team know the answers to the questions unless you talk to them or you come up with some way of um, 
some system in which you can make sure every every member in your group actually knows the answers. There's flexibility for redos. You can just pick a new student if one of them doesn't do well. Um, because uh, because it's kind of just you and the student with a laptop, um, you can ask them to write code, you can ask them to explain code that they have previously submitted, so on and so forth. And there's also no grading overhead outside of the class. Um, I think this is the wrong slide. Um, even though it says conclusion, this is the drawback slide and the previous one was the uh, conclusion slide. Uh, so the drawbacks are that uh, the instructor can do, in my experience, about 10 groups per week. Um, one of my courses or one of my sections has a group size of eight because of this, which is just too big. Um, eight students is a lot for them to talk to each other. And picking one student out of eight doesn't feel good to me. Uh, in an ideal world, I feel the group size should be less than around five. So some students underperform in a verbal interview context versus written. Um, there was at least one such case I found, and I imagine there's more as I keep telling. Um, students who know the proper answers, they're just not able to explain themselves properly. Um, if you're teaching a hybrid class, uh, it, there's a lot of challenges involved. Uh, students need to be either all in line in a group or all in class for them to be able to properly collaborate with each other. And if you have to interview a student who's online, um, it's just it just doesn't work. Um, you might have internet issues, some disturbances. Even if you don't have them, the student can just fake them and get out of the interview. And you, you have nothing you can do about it, I guess, at that point in time. So I think I'll go back to the conclusion. Um, I am grading an entire group based on how one particular student was doing, which is a little um, spicy, let's say. Um, a DI, for example, expected uh, there to be a lot of complaints when I first told him about it. Um, I also expected some complaints, uh, but uh, the amount was just one for the entire semester. There was just one time that I had a student completely bomb, uh, and I was able to deal. I mean, there was some other member from his group who complained about it, but I pointed out that he had marked the student as someone who attended for that week and participated in the activity for that week. So, um, Okay, never mind. Uh, students were actually watching lecture videos. Uh, in previous semesters, if at any point I'm sharing a lecture as a video, unless it's something absolutely critical to finishing an assignment, they wouldn't watch it. Um, they'd always pretend they watched it, but they wouldn't watch it unless it's just absolutely critical to some graded assignment. Uh, but for the semester, uh, they're actually watching them. Um, performance on other assignments, unrelated, has kind of gone up because uh, students are more likely to get help. Um, if they're stuck on something, they just ask a team member because they've already spoken to a... I guess they have more friends now. Um, uh, it also works, but it's ideal if the group size is smaller. It just doesn't work for hybrid classes unless you plan for it or change the activity in some way uh, to make it work. That is all I had to say. I see there is a question in chat. Um, is there any TA support for your class who might enact these interviews? So 
Um, I am teaching two sections of the same course. One of the sections has master's TAs, and I am comfortable asking them to do these interviews in my place. Uh, the other section has undergraduate TAs, and I am less confident in their ability to do them. So far, it's only been me uh, conducting these interviews. I also recorded one of them just to share with other faculty on how things are, but I'm not sure if it's okay for me to share. Uh, so I haven't added a link to the slides. That is all for me. Thanks, Drew. Uh, it was really cool to work with Drew and, and see this come together because I think it, it's novel, at least in computing. Um, and I'm, just, I'm not sure that I've heard of people in other disciplines using the randomization aspect of it. So hopefully someone got inspired with some cool ideas there. Um, my story is, is shorter, so we'll uh, pick up with a little bit of context for me. Um, I'm Angela Berardinelli. I am in, jointly appointed in computer science in the School of Data Science. I am a senior lecturer and I'm also the undergraduate program director for uh, data science. Most of my teaching in the past two years has been in the studio style team taught six credit data science undergraduate courses. Um, and I have the enrollments there for the past four semesters to give you kind of an idea of what we're working with. Uh, that's like first course, second course, first course, second course, fall, spring, fall, spring. Um, so that first course, your first and third numbers, that's a, that course is an even mix of sociology, ethics, and computing. And then the second course is like a social science research methods course plus programming and ethics. Um, the overarching, I guess, structure of the course is that students are completing large scale data science challenges in teams. Everything that we talk about in the course is in service to that larger project or that challenge. And um, obviously communication matters when you're working with a team. So um, that's kind of how this fits in. Uh, I've used tons of different ways of fostering communication in these courses, and I'm happy to expand on those. I felt like a lot of them were kind of run of the mill, so I didn't think they would necessarily be insightful here, but I do have two things, two smaller uh, things to share. The first is that I uh, implemented weekly project status reports. This was after the first semester working with the students in this style. Um, we just, had a lot of trouble assessing team contributions and understanding is one student doing all of the work, is everyone but one student doing all of the work, um, and one person is kind of riding on the coattails. Like that, that's just general concerns you have as, as an instructor when you uh, assign students to teams. Um, there was also, um, we wanted to do early intervention with students who were struggling with the content or just straight up not showing up and not participating. We wanted to be able to identify that, you know, within a week and, and try to intervene. Uh, some bonus outcomes from these, these status reports was that students were practicing written communication. I know Drew just went through why written can be um, a challenge in the classroom, but uh, we, we made it work. They were also reflecting on their work and their learning. You'll see that through the types of questions that I asked in a moment. Um, and I used it as an opportunity to gather feedback on the course itself. So here is the report. Let me make it big enough to read. A lot of practice zooming in in my browser <laughs> from teaching online for, for the pandemic. Um, so here's just a representative example from uh, a previous semester, the student's name and team number, um, project related activities, they, related activities they personally completed. This was to try and get at that personal contribution to the team. Um, project related activities that you worked on but didn't complete things you plan to do next week, trying to get students to reflect on where am I in the process? What have I accomplished? What am I in the middle of right now? And what am I going to do next? Um, reflecting on challenges and how you overcame them or didn't. Um, and then 
a, a numeric sort of rating of your contribution to the team and then the overall team's uh, progress. A reality check question, you know, they had six weeks to do this project. And so each week I update the percentage of like, you're on three of six, that's 50%. Are you 50% done with the project? Are you 10% done? And then um, a, a generic uh, feedback question, which um, I could be a little more pointed with in the future if there are things I really want to get at but uh, haven't felt the need yet. Our, our students work with us so closely, like over such a long period of time in the studio style courses that they, they don't really hold back. So I don't feel like I have to really nudge them for feedback. They will give it to us if, if we ask for it. Um, and so the other link I have here is some representative responses. Um, this one I may not zoom in as much because there's a lot going on here. Um, but you can see most of the students actually took the opportunity to talk about what they did. It looks like this is the week that everyone was working on their lit reviews. I see a lot of stuff about lit reviews in here. Um, and obstacles, this helps us understand is it something we needed to spend more time on or need to spend more time on in the future? It's, it, this is also a form of feedback about the course, uh, although some students are happy. We love to see that. Um, and then, yeah, some general feedback. So um, we've, I've, we found this very helpful in filling that gap over the, the semesters and the projects where we didn't use a status report in achieving these initial goals and i'm probably gonna have to there we go um come on google slides there we go so i think that we accomplished our initial goals very well we gave uh the students some some extra skills that we weren't even really targeting and so i'm happy to share this resource with anyone who thinks that they could adjust it for a similar use case in their courses and then my next thing to talk about is really short um, because it's more of a lead in or, or uh, to what DI is going to talk about. So this kind of actually is the thing I brought up in our team meeting that that got the whole ball rolling on this idea of randomization. It's not directly related, but it's what got us into this discussion. So I wanted to include it anyway. Plus, it's a, it's a good transition to what DI is going to talk about. So for a while, I've been using a Google form to collect daily attendance. Uh, by a while, I mean basically since March 2020, when I had to come up with something besides a sign-in sheet in the physical classroom, um, which is what I was using before that. Uh, one shout out I want to give to a helpful teaching tool is Yelkey. Um, it's good for things you're using in the moment in the classroom because what it does is it gives you a short and easy link. So what I will do is I'll take this Google form link for the for the daily attendance and instead of sending them that like three line long URL that sucks, I am going to put it into Yelkey and say leave this leave this link open for an hour and it will be like yelkey.com slash paper. And so I just tell my students, go to yelkey.com slash paper. And so it's a very easy, it's always like a, a simple, short English word um, after yelkey.com. And it's, but it's an expiring link. So you have to be a little careful. If it's something you want to put on Canvas to persist throughout the semester, you don't want to use that expiring link. Um, but it's really helpful for like in the moment stuff you're using in the classroom one time, and then they, they may not need to access it a lot later. Um, from that Google form, I transferred to a spreadsheet that tracks over time, which is labor intensive, which is what DI is going to improve upon. He's going to take some of that labor out of the process. Um, so he, he will talk about solutions to that problem in just a moment. Um, however, I will note that this transfer from a Google form spreadsheet to a more long term spreadsheet is less labor intensive than what I was doing with manual entry of paper forms pre pandemic. Um, so it was an improvement over what I was doing before, but DI has an even further improvement to share with you guys momentarily. Um, I'll just show these various stages really quickly and then we can move on. Um, so this is similar but different. So this is a specific date. I just ask for their name, where they're sitting, and anything you want to tell us. 
Um, and then, okay, I don't need any of this stuff anymore. That just turns into what you've seen before with, uh, with Google Sheets. And then I take that and transform it into, this is the labor intensive part, um, like attendance records for the entire semester. And I know it's not required here um, at UNC Charlotte. And we had a big discussion about attendance tracking um, as a follow-up to this discussion within our team. But I, since I started teaching in graduate school um, some number of years ago, I like I always wanted to know is attendance correlated with grades because that's something that that I was always told as a student like if you don't come to class you're going to do terribly and I was like is that true for my students and my style of courses and I haven't done that analysis in a while because my first several semesters of teaching I didn't see a correlation but I like collecting the data in case I ever did want to do kind of a longitudinal study of did that change over time for me my first several semesters of teaching there wasn't a relationship so I stopped looking at it if I get bored in the summer and decide to, to try and look at more recent semesters uh, did the pandemic change anything did I change anything like can I can I sort of see a difference so I still like tracking attendance even though it's technically not required for every class period by my job but uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from with attendance there was not any real communication or <laughs> randomization there this is really just a a lead into what i believe di wants to demo for you guys next um i'm going to stop screen sharing because i assume he wants to demo it is well, you all you get all the way to 9 45 so i could bow out today <laughs> no i i tried to I tried to keep it moving so you would have a little time to show off your uh your cool thing <laughs> Cool. Well, I um, she's talking about my cool thing, and I'm like, wait, didn't I get this from you? <laughs> I, know, I think I'm copying you. I don't have that much to add. Um, one of the great things about working on these groups is that um, I've found in 20 years of teaching, there's a lot of you really have to go out and find good examples. They're not just going to happen to you. And in my school, I teach full time at CPCC. Uh, we don't have a lot of opportunity to see other people's courses. And the only way to get those ideas is either you're looking online or you're you're in these kind of groups where you bounce ideas around. So just the you would think I've been using Google Docs for as long as they've been around. It never occurred to me to use them for attendance until this I joined this group. And it's like this light bulb, like, why wouldn't you? Um, so let me give a little bit of my background. I've been teaching uh, web technologies and programming and IT stuff at Central Piedmont Community College since about 2001. Prior to that, for about nine months, I was a consultant um, as the interim manager of instructional technologies. And then I did the dot bomb thing before that, and then the big, big six consulting firm before that for a while. Um, but the thing about that's unique about here at CPCC is in-person classes, the largest I've ever had was like 25, right? And so when I started teaching as an adjunct, it was right in the pandemic. So boom, I had a class of 40, but we had the option of coming back in person halfway through the semester and only five students did once a week. And we simulcast to Zoom. You have this cool studio there where there's a guy in the glass booth doing everything and everyone else was online. So that was interesting, but it was 40 and I was having to interact with them live. And then the next semester was back to the, you know, staying home completely and Zoom sessions with 70 people where everybody just turns off their mic, or turns off their mic and their camera. And uh, <clears throat> I occasionally would ask, like, would, would some of you please turn your camera on so I know you're alive, you know, so you get the face or what have you. And um, I had an incident where someone turned their camera on. They happened to be changing in the bathroom. It's like, no, turn it off, turn it off. <laughs> so, um, so finally, this is, I guess, last semester was sort of our first normal in-person experience, but we're still dealing with vestiges of the pandemic. So I said, well, the only way to deal with this properly, because so many people were sending emails that they were sick or they couldn't come in, is to simulcast Zoom while I lecture, right? And as those of you who've done that realize that it's it's tricky, like there's a lot of stuff to figure out. So I'm bringing my own webcam. I'm a big fan of these uh, these uh, Microsoft Life cams. I have like four of them. 
Um, and because uh, they, they rotate, they have pretty good audio, so they can actually pick up questions in the room. And as I'm walking back and forth in this very large room, they can pick up the audio. And um, so I always start the class by opening up Zoom. I have it pre-scheduled, so there's one that matches every class. And then I, I, the first few times I'd forget. So what I'm gonna do is actually kind of walk you through the first few minutes of the class. So number one is I'll, I'll, and let me go ahead and share the screen. Um, and what was really interesting to me is that yesterday, I mean, I know we all know this, but I don't know that it's really dawned on us how much things really have changed because prior to the pandemic, there were screen sharing tools and we had video recording tools, but they just weren't normal. That was an exceptional thing. And now it's completely normal. Like the fact that we're having this meeting this way, nobody would bat an eye. Like, yeah, let's just get together on Zoom or at my school, it's WebEx or the other school, it's Microsoft Teams. And that is what I would consider a pretty seismic shift in what's possible because now other things are entirely possible and there's no reason not to simulcast other than these kind of little technical headaches. So here's a Java class I teach. And what I've got, and uh, I won't even bother making apologies for general design. I just want everything <laughs> to be easy to find. So at the top, I have this link that says attendance. And this way they can just go into Canvas and then click the attendance link. And it's one link and it goes to a form. So I'll show you that form. It loads up just like you see here. However, we're gonna have a little bit of fun with this. I made one just for us um, here. And what I'm gonna do is, uh, is share the link with you all. Uh, remind me where to get it up here. I just created this. Um, you want to click send, the send uh, button, and then, and then the link. link. Yep, and copy. There you yeah, go. I, this is the kind of thing where you're like, why isn't there just an obvious thing right there on the page? So I've just put that in the chat, and I'd like you all to do the do your attendance, please. So I have a forever record of who came to this little session, and um, but you're going to run into something in a moment which is that um, there's a prompt. And the prompt is what allows me to keep you from just logging in from home and saying you're here and then logging out or anything. Well, actually, no, you can still fake that, but you have to be present at that moment. Um, and so today's prompt is, you can see I'm in my office uh, and I've been here a long time. I've got like four Macs up there and surveying equipment. So I want you all to guess something unusual that I have in my office, right? Just like I'm betting that after 20 years here and being a weird person, not a weird person, but an unusual person, that, that is it possible he could have one of these in his office? So that's the prompt. So you all got three minutes to do that or two because it's easy. That's four field. So go ahead and do that and I'll keep yapping. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and open up the one I use for my real students. And I'm also going to look at the one. So three of you have done it. That's good. So far, I know we have a few more, right? Make my Zoom screen. And I think we're at a point now where just uh, classrooms need to start having dual monitors because there's just, uh, there's just no good way to do the Zoom simulcast thing without having a way to monitor the chat and the video simultaneously. I have to have my TA keep an eye on chat and if the TA is not there, I have a student volunteer because it's hard, I'll, I'll see a question that was asked half an hour ago during the class. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people here. And it looks like we've got about seven attending. Yeah, so one of you is slacking, but that's okay. Hopefully you check the Slack button, right? So here you see the result on the spreadsheet. Uh, before I jump to this, I wanna go back to what I do at the beginning of the class. So there's attendance, and then I have this link to a shared doc. And the shared doc is a document that anybody can edit and students tend to not edit, but sometimes I'll ask them to. Um, and I just start out with the agenda. So I've gone ahead and made one for us today. Um, but I also made a note because at the beginning of the semester last year, I was having a hard time remembering. I would start Zoom and forget to share screen, or I would share screen but forget to record. I would record but forget to turn on auto captioning. And, um, and so I just, now that's kind of innate, but maybe I won't do it for a semester, I'll forget. So it's like, here's all the things I need to do when I start. Um, and then I, so then I'll go and I'll say, 
I'll go ahead and start. And I do this in front of the students, typically in that first minute of class. I say, today is Tuesday, uh, 3 22. Um, and then I might say, prompt is guess what's in DI's, DI's office. Um, and then what else we're going to do? Um, show attendance, uh, show randomization. Uh, show over time. What else do I want to do today? Wheel of Terror um, and shared code if time. Okay. So does anyone have any questions that I should add to the agenda or any suggestions before I keep going? So I'm doing this just like I do in class. Did you have trouble? And occasionally a student will raise their hand and say, I'm like yesterday it was I'm confused about the difference between substring and index of. Right, because we're doing in Java, it's how you how you manipulate strings and get values out of out of words, right? So I add that to the list, right? Um, and then I make sure to cover it, or if I don't cover it, I have a little niggler that says you forgot to do that. Maybe carry it over to the next class because I can look at what I did the last class and maybe realize that I never got to the last three items. So now we've got this attendance, and what I've done is there's a little bit of code that randomly selects everybody from today. And so Dhruv is my random selection here. And I'm like, well, you know, Dhruv is kind of, he's kind of intimidating and I, I, I don't wanna ask him a question because he might know more about it than me. So I'll refresh and good, I got Kiran. Kiran, you good? Can you unmute yourself? I'm here, yes. How are you feeling today? Pretty good. A little bit on the spot? Always on the spot. Always on the spot. <laughs> so this is a, a weird anomaly. What did you notice, Kiran, that just happened on my screen? Why did my... I call on you if Jules is up here? Oh, yeah. I didn't, really, didn't even notice that. I was just listening. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> and so the, the interesting thing is, so this is all Zoom. And all Zoom is actually, I think, a little easier than half Zoom and half in person. So last night, I think I had about 25 students in person and 20 on Zoom. And um, part of the challenge is when you tell them you're gonna Zoom every time and that that's okay, a lot of them are like, hey, why not just do it all the time? I found out recently one of my students has a couple kids and uh, it's hard when you have kids to get away and come to class and go back. It's a whole other animal, right? So what, one of the downsides is that I found with, with Google I have this little randomization script, which you can see up here, but it, it's a little bit quirky. So it's not like it'll, it'll, I'll refresh and that'll give me somebody new. Um, but then that person will disappear and somebody else will reappear. So I have Kiran again um, and then switch to Gabe. So I haven't had time to really debug Google's platform. Um, you could probably do this in Excel, but here's the beauty of this. Uh, we, we're back to what Angela said is that I, I do like to have a record of attendance. I have yet to use it. At my full-time job, this is a huge part of what we do is attendance. And if somebody stops attending, we have to mark them as such, and then they might lose their financial aid. And um, in some cases, they're not allowed to participate in the class anymore. And it's, a, it's just a big, huge paperwork nightmare. So we're blessed at UNCC to not have to do that. However, I believe there's something to be said for talking to that student saying, you know, you haven't been to class in two weeks. Like it's kind of hard to take college seriously and take all this money and time and effort and then not go. Um, a friend of mine said years ago when I first started teaching, he says college is one of the few services where that people pay for, but they're happy when you don't give them the service. So when you all go to class on a Wednesday night and say, all right, class is canceled. Everyone's like, Woo like, wait a minute. You should be complaining that I took away the thing you paid for. But this is not how it works. Um, so let me jump to the actual the attendance I have of my of my actual Java class, and you can see this is from the beginning of the this is from when I started using this thanks to our meetings with Angela. Um, so you see I started um, in mid February, right? So I missed the first month or so. But what I can do here is I could actually sort by any of the names, and that way I could get all of the instances of one student. Um, in one place. So if I sorted, I could get Baines and just see all the times that Baines was there. Because typically you're only really caring about this, that particular student at that particular moment, right? 
Um, and then I can just see. So the nice thing is because the form time stamps it. And I realized that the prompt itself is not even necessary because, I mean, it, it's necessary to make sure they've connected and they see you or they get the prompt. But because we have a time step to the minute and the second, they would actually have to log in and mark themselves present during the class time. Otherwise, it would be obvious that it was an hour before or at midnight. So even then, um, it's, it's actually just really great. And what I used to do is I would have them put their name in the shared document, and then I would paste it into an unshared spreadsheet. And I, every after every class, I would paste and paste and paste and have all these tabs. And this just took all that away. So I owe Angela lunch because now I don't have that extra step that I had. And I do have a single record. And really, I could sort of use this in perpetuity. I thought of having you guys do this one, but I just bugged me a little bit, but it's a different day. And I don't have class today, so I would know, oh, that's the one. One group of students doesn't match any of the others is from the ALA workshop. But I actually make separate ones for each, each class. And I've really, this has really grown on me only after just a couple months of using it. And I think I'm going to carry this forward to everything I do and it'll become one of those best practices. Um, the ran so let's get to the randomization because we're pretty much over time now. Um, when I was undergrad, the, I found that the business classes were very, very heavy on participation to the order of 50% of your grade. Um, and that was hard to do with 30 people in a class. The teacher would have a roster and a seating chart and he would cold call people. And he had all these readings to do. And he'd say, uh, Ms. Thomas, can you tell us about the Dalcon Shield case? And if Ms. Thomas hadn't read the case, she was like, Arr! and you'd see him make a little tick mark, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so I realized like it's, when my small class is here at the here at CPCC, it's easy to make sure I touch base with everyone. I will just bounce around the room. I learn their names, call, call, call. With 70 people, I can't learn their names. And I know myself, I'm going to fail to be random about it. This means that there's no personality attached. This is not me calling on the student who always gives the right answer or giving a hard time to the student who, who may not know what's going on. They all are on alert because I could call them at any moment and they know it. And sometimes in true random form, it'll call the same person three times in one class. And other times it'll call someone who's never, never been called on. I don't use it all the time, every time. There are some cases where it's just not appropriate, but sometimes I'll just say, okay, so-and-so stuck on a bit of code that she's demonstrating in class. And I'll do the randomization and say, hey, so-and-so, uh, can you figure out what she's doing? And I give them the option just to say pass. But there is that even saying pass means they acknowledge they've been recognized that they're not entirely comfortable with it. I learned that they're not comfortable with it and they move on. Um, so that's kind of the, the quick version. And we're at 955. I can keep yapping, but I think we definitely did want to wrap in an hour, right? Um, so let me stop there. I, I've got some other similar related examples, but um, that might be enough for now. And maybe we'll open it up to questions. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, so any questions, follow-ups, suggestions for improvement, anything anyone wants to chat about with what we, the, the couple of strategies we presented today? Come on, Harini, help us out. <laughs> I, yeah, I just, sorry, I just thought I'd turn on my video now that I'm actually trying to talk. Um, so I have a question. I, I've been using Poll Everywhere to take attendance. And, you know, usually there's, my question itself is on the screen. So it's kind of doing something similar to what you your prompt is doing, right? Um, apart from the randomization, which I really like, I like, you know, just picking one person and talking to them personally and so on. But apart from that, do you see a um, sort of a specific disadvantage of using Poll Everywhere? And any, any thoughts on that? I'm just curious if... I, I was really excited about Poll Everywhere when we were developing the, the rework of the Java course, um, but it just, it, it was a lot of work. And the few times I tried to use it, I, it, it wasn't working for me. I went to class early, I had a student volunteer to help and we couldn't get the links to work. And it just seemed like a real, a real burden um, to getting it to go smoothly every time. So it may be that I just haven't done it enough. I don't do PowerPoint. I always do Google Slides. I want everything that I can do independently in my laptop. I just log in and it's there. Mm -hmm. So I'm really looking for easy links. And what I've learned is that 
any element of friction, like I'm already plugging in my camera, plugging in a separate keyboard and mouse because I'm so tall to stand at the podium, I need to do that. And someone always like puts it in the far corners, some, like whoever comes after me in the class really resents my second keyboard and mouse. <laughs> and I'm, then I'm zooming and I'm recording and I'm turning on all this stuff. So like how many more pages do, do we need to open up? So with Poll Everywhere, then they go to that and, and can I create one that I just keep using or do I have to change it for each class? And so I have yet to see that it's um, much added value where in this case, it's one link in the course done. All I have to do is click it and do attendance, right? Whereas, um, so I'd be, I would love to hear if there is a cleaner way. And I want to use Poll Everywhere as a conversation. I like seeing the quick results like, oh, look, eight people got it right. But so far I haven't been, it, it just seems like there's a lot of friction on that. I, I've been using it quite successfully for, and I, I don't do it just for attendance, right? There's usually that extended quiz and just one question is for specifically for attendance. Well, that's the question though, is if they're doing the quiz anyway, you almost don't need the question for attendance, right? Correct. Because if they did it, they were there. Right, and so often they I do that. Although I have had some students who will randomly guess at the answer and answer the poll everywhere, but not be in class at the time. So is there not a timestamp on it? There's a timestamp, but they, they can see when the quiz is active because Poll Everywhere will show you. So if they log in from wherever they are, they know class starts at this time. Oh, I see. So they're not actually in Zoom, for example, but they're just... Correct. They're just randomly guessing at the answers and they get most of the questions wrong, but they pretend... That to be seems different. really bizarre. <laughs> you know, I caught four students doing that last time because I, I kept saying something in class. I'm like, no, no, don't answer it yet. And the I kept clearing the answers and they kept coming back. Oh, so I'm like, okay, I'll pass an attendance sheet around to you. Let's see what happens. No, that's, that's terrible. Weird. That's terrible. And I did last year, I remember coming into the classroom I was using and there was a huge line because the TA was trying to get people to sign out on a roster. And it was 70 people trying to sign their name on a single sheet of paper. I was like, come on, guys, like get out of the class. We're, we're trying to do something here. So I think, I think we need digital, but I think, um, I think if I were using poll everywhere successfully in class, I would, as much as I would miss the prompts and these things, because sometimes I'll say like, what's the worst IT cat catastrophe you've had? And there's like phone in the toilet and, you know, coffee on the laptop and all those things. And, or, or I'll say like, what's your favorite comfort food? I mean, I, 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 they're a little bit of fun and I think they engage students, but if I had an alternative, I would, that was easier and faster. I probably would use it. So, when I was a student, um, the poll everywhere prompts used to get shared a lot. Uh, but the thing is, if there's a threat of randomly picking someone, you can't do that. Yeah, I really like that randomization. So I can add yeah. that to my poll everywhere, you know, once yeah. the poll everywhere is done. So I, I definitely like that part. If anyone's interested, I can show you. I know that um, Angela thought this would be cute. I, I had the what I called the wheel of death. There's a website where you um, you can just paste any list into into. Oh, a, please uh, share it. Please share it. Yeah, okay. I, I know well, we're we're over time now. I wouldn't respect everybody's time. If if you have to leave, that's okay. But if you feel like staying on for a few more minutes later, I want to see the wheel of death. <laughs> so this is just what there's many of these on the website. But what I could do is I can go to the attendance. Um, so I stopped doing this when I randomized the thing in in. Um, in uh, Google, so I'll go. I'll go here, and you can basically create your own. And I would have to do this all at the beginning of class, so it was just that much more overhead. But so now we have a list, right? Yeah, it skipped me. <laughs> and you can actually go in here, and you can cust. So you can imagine. I'll put. I'll have like. 70 people there and there's all kinds of settings of the noise it makes and it was taking 10 seconds which was take way too long so in the customization i would say well no make it make it one second because after the third time you really want to go fast and oh uh, please put the link to this in the chat so the spin spin time this. <laughs> oh, that's the volume will go up higher and the spin time will do fast max number of names on the wheel so now when i click it watch how fast it is it's like boom there's harini and then we've got the lightning. So this is, 
Um, I think there's a bunch of variations. I don't like the ads. And the, the problem is when I, when I saved it, you can create an account. But when I saved it, of course, that was, that was the students for that day, not the students for today. So I still would have to customize it. But I, I like the idea. I think it'd be nice if there were, if that could pull right off my spreadsheet and get rid of the ads, I'd, I'd be happy to pay a few bucks for it. This would be fun to do in class. <laughs> I'll just add. I don't something. think you pasted it in the chat yet. I think you just oh. copied it, but didn't paste it. <laughs> oh no! Uh, you he he sent it just. Cool. He sent it just to me. Here, I'm going to oh, send it okay. to everybody. Message, Hold on, I'm, I'm sending like, it to everybody. It. Here we go. There, yeah, we got it. There, thanks. That's really cool. I'm going to have to use that in the future as well. Sorry, I was going to add something. Um, uh, Dhruv, Angela, Di, I, I think your strategies today are really um, well thought of and conceived. You're really solving a big problem that everybody has, right? Which is really trying to get to know your students and engage with them and give appropriate feedback through their assessments. Um, I did want to like, I was just thinking if I was you, um, a lot of the strategies you're sharing is really putting a lot of cognitive effort on you as a faculty to be in the role to be the assessor, right? And and verbally listening to students give answers to you, like Dhruv, you know, listening to each group, Angela, and, you know, having them sort of do one-on-one -on -one with you or verbal assessment can take a toll on you. So I just wanted to say like, like, you know, every now and then um, it can be exhausting after some time to use an approach like this where it's so much depend, a lot of the information is now on you and then now you have to extract it somewhere. So another, you know, doing what one approach to, to mitigate this cognitive load on you could be like every now and then you, you extract it, right? So you document it, write it, take it out every week so that you have space to add more. <laughs> It's like a it's like a waterfall, right? You constantly have this this coming in, and so you know I just wanted to like um, I was just thinking about your processing and your mental you know work around this as a faculty, and you know just be careful that you might get tired and burnt out after a semester of doing this, uh, and to sustain such work you would really need to extract um, everything every now and then. That's true. Yeah, I'm. I'm curious, Drew. You said you did the verbal interviews, right? I, I know you said roughly thirty minutes per student, etc. Is how did no. that go? Um, no, so, and I know you reduced it after that, right? Mm. Uh, so I was just extrapolating from how long it takes to do one question if you want to ask all questions. Right. right. Probably thirty minutes. Um, I, I also have a Google form for grading. I enter the student's name, who I'm grading, what question I asked, how they did, things like that. So I have ways for making it easier for myself. Uh, but generally, they know what the question is. You just tell them, okay, I'm asking you this question. Uh, they start talking, you point out the flaws, and or you ask them to compose the sentences again. Generally, it goes pretty quickly. Um, last week, I asked them about the labs for the first time. Um, and then you can tell quickly who actually did their own lab and who was just. So I think this is just the first semester I'm trying it. Probably over a semester or two, it'll get better. But so far, I think it's much better than just doing a lecture and hoping your students get it. Oh yeah, I, I definitely see the advantages uh, of it. I'm just wondering, in my mind, when you were talking, I was silently relating all of this to the academic integrity problem that we have, right? So if you talk to a student one-on-one, -on -one, like you said, it's quite easy to figure out whether they really understood and so on. So have you, I guess my question is this, you're randomly picking one student in a group you know, let's say you somehow figure out there's some violation that's happened. How do you address that? So and, and... far, I'm hoping I don't figure out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so far, that's my strategy. Um, I think understand. Um, I, I, yeah. <laughs> and uh, if I do end up with something like that, I'm hoping to just email Dr. Long. And yeah. 
let's hope you don't come across anything. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up for today. This has been a really exceptional um, presentation. Thank you so much to Angela, to Drew, and to DI for presenting today.